I was born in Liverpool, just round the corner from Chinatown. My early memories are of a busy, bustling area full of character and characters, a self-contained community. Returning today, I noticed certain changes. A new Chinatown is beginning to emerge. But on the surface, the people and traditions are much the same as they've always been. Now on Radio Merseyside, we're time at five to nine, time for the Chinese Community News, read this evening by Brian Wang and Raymond Cheng. To have a good look at the Chinatown of today, we've got to come back to where it all began. The place where the first Chinese seamen stepped ashore from their various merchant ships. And this is the place, the Liverpool docks. In 1835, the Liverpool-based Holt Shipping Company were the first people to take advantage of the opening of the China trade. This required more British merchant ships and, in turn, more crews. And the Chinese seamen were just there to fit the bill. So having arrived in Liverpool, unloaded their belongings, sorted the ship out, the first wave of Chinese seamen needed a place they could congregate. It had to be near to the docks, and in fact, the area they chose to congregate later developed into what is now known as Chinatown. This is Pitt Street, and at the turn of the century, this was the place where the first wave of Chinese seamen settled down. It's very close to the docks. It was a Victorian street, very narrow, cobblestones, and the seamen just poured in, really. They used to congregate on street corners, do a lot of chat, they had their boarding houses, their laundries, everything they wanted, it was very self-contained. And it boomed, it got, grew bigger and bigger, up to around about 1920, 1930, when because of the uh, economic depression, because of immigration laws, the whole thing began to go flat. But at the beginning of the Second World War, Pitt Street was bombed and flattened. This gave birth to Nelson Street, which in fact now is the Chinese community, quite thriving. Great George's Square, now a park and a playground. When I was a kid, it was a bowling green, two bowling greens, in fact. And as kids, we were always trying to get in here, but we were always getting chased away. And the Nelson Street side was always quite bustly, full of people, anything like that. But this side had a sort of spookiness, a sort of frightness about it, mainly because of a place called the boarding house, or as it's locally known, Number 10. Now derelict, this is the only remaining example of what were many such boarding houses each taking in up to 150 seamen at one time. This was the recreation yard. The guys had come out here, get some air, because it was very crowded in there. It'd be uh, very sparse, very functional. These were all the rooms. Every one of them would be crowded, full of people. So the noise was pretty bad. In winter, I imagine they're very cold, and in summer, quite hot. As you walk about now, there's still an atmosphere, a feeling of being watched, perhaps even that you're not really alone. This was the kitchen. It's damp and decaying now, but it's not so hard to imagine the noise, heat and chaos that an overworked staff had to endure to provide food for so many men.
These rooms were part of the living quarters. A room would contain at least ten double bunks, no furniture, and clothes were hung on a rail which circled the room. A small curtain which could be drawn around each bunk gave the only privacy in what must have been a very overcrowded and noisy atmosphere. Now only the spirits in the empty rooms are left, but there are still people in Chinatown with very clear memories of the seamen and the boarding houses. One of them is Kenneth Lowe, who was attached to the Chinese consulate during the war years. You were here when this place was thriving with uh, all different kinds of uh, seamen, all different nationalities. I mean, what was it like? Well, it was a real boom town then, you see, and there were the Chinese community had a lot of clubs, seamen's club of one type or another. And during the latter part of the war, many of those who were wounded people actually helped them to open restaurants, provincial restaurants, you mm. see. And the Chinese were extremely authentic in Liverpool at that time. What numbers, what sort of numbers are we talking about then? Well, the total number is about 15, 18,000, but at any given time, about half the number would be in port. Mm. And they had to be housed, they had to be fed and entertained. You know, whenever you have a lot of people congested together with quite a lot of money because all these men were signed off on a ship after having served six months, six years, with 500 pounds in a pocket, or 5,000 pounds even in a well, pocket. Well, they'd never draw pay during that time. Yeah. Well, they would draw very little pay, you mm. see. They don't need pay, any pay on board ships. But mm. In fact, in this square now, perhaps there were a lot of boarding houses, but the only one left is, is number 10 over there. How did that place actually work? I mean, yeah, usually they have uh, these seamen sleeping in bunks, you see. They could easily put a, a dozen people or more in a room. So when they come ashore, they're very lazy lot. You stay in bed all day long. What the boarding house master did was uh, to collect the Russian books and open a restaurant next door using the Russian books to acquire the rice and the, uh, and the meat, you see. So by the time the seamen got up and they found that the meal time was over, they had to go next door to the restaurants to have the meal, which cost about five times as much. <laughs> they pay twice. Yes. But you, you were here at mm -hmm. a very unique time, uh, those five years that you were here. Mm -hmm. I mean, how would you sum up then and now, I mean, how would you sum up Liverpool, basically? Well, um, as far as the Chinese community is concerned, I don't think it's changed that much, except for the seamen who receded, disappeared from the sea. Mm. As for the local community, it was quite an elderly crowd then. It's still an elderly crowd. They still live the same mode of life. I don't think the Chinese community um, has ever really broken out of their confines, mainly because of their language barrier. You see the Chinese community, whether in um, North America or Lima, Peru, or anywhere, they're a very static and uh, conservative community. Yeah. Mainly because uh, that's the way they live and they haven't learned any other way. They're living exactly the same life as uh, 50 or 80 years ago. If the people are living the same lives, some of the older traditions haven't changed either. This is the headquarters of the Chinese Freemason Society, founded at the birth of the community and still is active today. It was set up to offer help and advice to those accepted as members. Non-members are not normally allowed inside, but I was lucky enough to be invited in to meet Mr. Town, the head mason, and Mr. Lim, the secretary. Uh, this is our main sitting room, as for the people to come here and read the newspapers, some magazines, and some of our, our own publicities, and watch televisions. A meeting place, really? Yeah, a meeting place, mm. actually, yes. Um, and how about the things on the wall there? Can you explain well, what they are? Uh, these, these, all Chinese should know, that's Dr. Sun. Uh, we recognize as the father of China, right? And these are the names and the money they raised for charities to for this building first uh, formed. That was in 1942. Mm -hmm. This is the notice board for the association. And for instance, 
The first notice is for the new building to be built, or we call renovation for this, this premises. And how we're going to do is the second one, we need more members to join in and the regulations. And the third one is the very old style of Chinese accounts. And they put it down, say, how much raised and how much money been spent and how much money in the current account, how much money in the deposit account for the association. Hard work and using their money wisely seems to be second nature to the Chinese. The early settlers were quick to recognize the needs of their community, and so was launched the Chinese laundry and early catering ventures. One man who witnessed the early development of the laundry and restaurant trade is a unique character in Chinatown, Jack Yu, MBE. After the war, the men and women from here, been in the services, they have traveled to the east. They, they have got a, a taste, a taste of Chinese cooking. So the Chinese, you know, Chinese used to be only doing laundry. And then when Chinese uh, find out there's something easier to do, they open restaurants, then laundry start to die out because uh, nobody liked hard work. It was too hard. So they changed into like restaurants all over different uh, communities. And then soon after that, uh, they start opening, taking over fish and chip shops and uh, uh, sort of add the Chinese uh, dishes in the menu. So gradually then they they all changed. It, some of the laundry, even laundry, changed into a, a Chinese takeaway. So that's how they go on. Alongside the boom in restaurants is the ever-increasing popularity of the Chinese supermarkets, which cater for those who wish to take their love of Chinese food one stage further and cook it themselves. The Lowe family have for three generations owned a grocery store in Chinatown. David Lowe, the present owner, is keeping pace with this new demand. What about the Chinatown you were born into? How different is it today? Oh, it's changed a lot, obviously, you know, everything is pre-packed and that sort of thing now, which, is, you know, it's... And that's right, I remember, actually, when I was a kid coming into the shop, a lot of it was in barrels or whatever, That's right, it? in big bins, vats, and if you wanted four ounces, you weigh up four ounces. Different, you know, yeah. <laughs> different generation. Are you getting more European customers? Yeah, over the last five years, there's been a tremendous increase, you know. And is that without really encouraging them? Oh, yes. Yeah. Well, Chinese food, you know yourself, has been very popular in this country. And it's, it's had a boom probably about um, just after the war, 1945, 50. Mm. And then it died off a bit when the chop suey bit got, you know, got a bit boring. But now we've come, we've hit a new, um, a new surge sort of thing, which, you know, and whereas people, you know, there's, they're being introduced to better Cantonese food, mm. more of an authentic ty you know, type of food. Mm. And so, you know, the people are going for it. <laughs> Despite changing tastes, the restaurant trade continues to flourish. So too does the tradition of the family unit working together within their own business. This has always involved the children in the family helping from an early age until the day they leave school and work for the parents full time. To break away from this tradition was in the past almost impossible. But today, an ever increasing number of young Chinese are questioning the role which has always been expected of them. I make contact with a young group who have come together with the same aims in mind. The idea of this uh, Merseyside Chinese youth, youth Associations to get all the youth in, in Merseyside together, which means we can organize a lot of things like uh, social activities and sport activities. Our main aims are to try and get the youth in the Chinese community involved in to care more about the Chinese society as a whole. Um, we try and do this by two or three methods, mainly functions such as discos, um, outings, regular outings, and maybe other events such as, maybe not so popular, but 
say, canoeing, mountaineering, camping, that kind of event? I mean, we're only starting, well, we, we've been set up for over a year now. So um, as soon as we get the base, um, we hope to expand from there. Can you sort of explain the problems that, that, that you've come across, though, and, and reasons why you've, got to, why, why you've had to form yourselves? Um, I, I think because there's no other youth asso uh, association in Liverpool like us. That's why we formed ourselves. Lots of, lots of us here now have, have parents have a shop or something like whereby they have to work all the time. Now, if we can work a way in which they could um, find, find some time together, and, w and work together, rather than just being, uh, rather than just be a number. I mean, you go on, you go on in Liverpool, and, and you you hear programs saying in Liverpool there's so many thousand fish and chip shops and so many thousand Chinese. They all figures. They, they, they know the identity to any one of them. So why not bring their identities out in one way or another? And this, I hope, is one way to bring them out. You're being very radical, and you're saying you want to break out of the system, but uh, without explaining the system. I mean. Why do you want to break out the system? What is the system? The present idea of the Chinese previously was uh, chip shops, laundries, and uh, restaurants. You know, they, they seem to graduate. They start off in laundries, graduate to a chippy, and then finally to a restaurant, and that full stop. That's the, um, the basic idea in a lot of people's eyes, even amongst the Chinese themselves. A lot of people uh, are fixed in, th in that way. They're brought up in the chip shop. Um, they, they live the whole life in the chip shop. Uh, they may die in the chip shop and see nothing else. Well, we're trying to break out of that. Everyone here wants to evolve from that, change from that. I live in the chippy. You, you live in the chippy. Mm -hmm. uh, but I know a number who are, even though they live in the chippies, are still uh, moving forward, you know, uh, getting good grades, uh, hoping to do something with their lives rather than follow their parents into the chippy. For the time being, it's still there. It's still a future. It's still an opportunity. The thing is that Basically, Chinese people are business orientated and they are businessmen and business people and enterprising in their own right. One young man who's been quick to catch on to the growing demand for videos is shop owner Kenny Chan. What made you get into videos? Well, I think video, uh, you can beat lots of Chinese mm. and uh, also you can make a little bit of money, of course. <laughs> well, how long have you had the shop? Uh, about three years. Because it's a completely sort of new departure, isn't it? From mm, the normal it sort of restaurants or takeaways. Mm -hmm. They're all marked in Chinese, so I can't, I can't read them. There's no good English person coming <laughs> no, in. No, no. Just stuff like that. No, no chance. So what, because what? all the uh, videotape are speak Chinese, so it's no way. And what's on them? Well, just make a sample, like this one. Eh? It's a long, long series, long television series, like a, a com, like a, a combination street. A sort of Chinese Hong Kong equivalent? It is. Yeah. It takes about uh, 30 to 35 tapes to uh, finish. 30 to 35 tapes? Uh-huh. So who watches them? Well, of course, the youngers, they like a Kung Fu series yeah. and a Kung Fu story, of course. And um, also, they like a love story. Mm. When the old, old age, of course, they like a... They, know, they, they want to know what happened in Hong Kong and they want to... Uh, more traditional stuff. Happened, yeah. So you've actually hit a very good patch, you know, a, 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 a yeah. vein which is actually working now. Yeah. Though video programmes may keep a large section of the community entertained, many of the youngsters still favour the more active pursuits. One of the most popular has always been the martial arts class. Most of these kids are just here for the fun of it and a chance to meet friends. But for some, the spirit of Bruce Lee lives on.
Chinatown has two working community centres, both set up rather like youth clubs. There is, though, a third one, which is the first purpose-built Chinese community centre in Europe, providing, among other things, rehearsal facilities like this. But as yet, it is unable to serve fully the community, due mainly to the lack of funding. Brian Wang, the community liaison officer for Chinatown, explained his ideas for the new centre. This is an uh, idea I perceived four and a half years ago because I feel it's very important for the Chinese community in here have a place where they can turn to when they need help in welfare advices and cultural activities and uh, sports activities. How much are you asking for to run the centre? This will only ask about 17,000 per year and in fact compared with the uh, construction cost of 228,000, it was quite a small amount. What do you think the future of the Chinese community is going to be? I think the future of the Chinese community is very good because Chinese will go out of the catering trade and do more contribution other than the versatility of the food from the Chinese people. We promote culture and for the, all the other peoples coming here, not only because uh, they can learn something of the Chinese, but they can mix with Chinese people and gain mutual understanding. So the relationship between the Chinese and other people in the future will be much more harmonious than now. The strength of the Chinese community has always been its self-containment, but today it faces changes from within, a breaking up, perhaps, of traditional values which the older generation are reluctant to accept. But the problems of the modern Chinatown are far removed from the hopes and ambitions of the early settlers. They came with a dream of working and saving enough to return home to China to live a long and prosperous life. A few achieve that ambition, but most lie here that dream unfulfilled. But the pride of those early seamen is still very much a part of today's Chinatown. We're very proud of our surname. It is me, you and you, yep. We're very proud of our surname. Now, when you go out, keep that surname clean and keep the Chinese, the, Chinese, the word Chinese clean. So that's how we go on. <laughs> Tong 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 Tong